So welcome to the first of what might be several conversations on how do we change our thinking around long format meetings? It's kind of my title. And uh, my name is Ruth Milligan. I am the founder of Articulation, a local training and coaching practice here in Columbus. Thank you all of you for raising your hand on LinkedIn to join. I have no expectations of what will come out of this meeting, but I wanna just state before we introduce each other that um, we will uh, talk about the purpose and what we all hope to achieve as we introduce ourselves. So that's what I'd like to do is to go around, tell us who you are. I might add that Helmut, who's just to my left or right, is our producer for the call. So he'll be monitoring the chat. If you have any technical questions, um, you can send him a private message and he can help to troubleshoot. And so let's go ahead and uh, just, why don't you share who you are, where, you, where, where are you physically right now, like both in your home and in a city? And then also, what do you hope, why did you come to this call? What do you hope to get out of it? So Helmut, go ahead and start with yourself and I'll just keep going across the top as I see people's um, pictures. Hi. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Helmut Batchold. I work for Ruth. My function today is being the producer or the co-host uh, for technical assistance. I physically in Clintonville, which is a little suburb of Columbus, Ohio. Thanks, Helmut. All right, Helen. Thanks, Ruth. My name is Helen Canning. I work at United Healthcare in Minneapolis, and Ruth was one of uh, was the partner who gave us uh, the tools to be an IABC International <laughs> Gold <laughs> Quill winner for our employee experience with the help of Ruth. So we're firm believers in what Ruth and the team can help us deliver. But why did you come to this call, Helen, aside from giving me lots of nice um, We We have about uh, 100 senior leaders that gather every year for a CEO forum. And we're not gathering this year. We want to do it virtually. And they're located throughout the United States. And their time is very valuable. So we're trying to figure out a better way that we can deliver a two-day CEO for forum virtually. Great. Thank you, Helen. It's very kind. And for those of you who don't know what IABC is, it's the... International Association of Business Communicators, right? Good. Okay, Anne Blum, you're up. Um, my name is Anne Blum. I am talking to you live from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, so just a little bit north of, of Ruth and Helmet. Um, I am a senior instructional designer at a company called Roundtable Learning, and we specialize in um, virtual reality and augmented reality-based learning. Um, and I am really here today at, at Ruth's gracious invitation to um, learn from all of you and to hear uh, what you all are thinking about. Um, so Ruth, thank you for including me and I look forward to speaking with all of you. Anne's being modest. I'm gonna tap her to, to share a few of her sort of boundaries and guardrails for uh, when you're doing online learning and instructional design. Um, as you think about that and translate, translating to your meetings. So thank you, Erin, for being here. Tracy, you're up. Okay, hi. It's nice to see people. Um, I'm Tracy Preston. I work at The Ohio State University. Um, I'm in communication marketing event space for business and finance. And what's in the middle of a really large showcase, um, which Ruth and her amazing team we're in the middle of helping us um so we've you know obviously not having that but um so as a high state is pulling things completely back um i'm in a position where i want to keep my job and um i'd like to learn um just how people are putting together events um structuring them um to make them palatable sellable um how you get the, the right information out given that this dynamic is changing and I, I think that there's an opportunity actually for um 
this to be a really positive um, momentum because we can now maybe garner more participants um, for some of our showcases that for our startup community, for example, that we wouldn't be able to get um, people to like, you know, our angel investors, for example. So um, I think at this point, I, I just want to try to see how I can repivot this. And I appreciate this opportunity. Tracy works a lot in tech transfer and technology startups. So it's a big thing. All right, Siraj. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm um, calling from my uh, kitchen. Uh, sitting on my island that has now become my desk. Um, I live in the short north and it's been um, interesting to walk around the short north for my morning and afternoon and evening and late evening walks and to see it uh, pretty quiet and I'm looking forward for it to be humming uh, hopefully soon. Um, I lead an organization called RTRX um, it was born out of um, a private equity firm called Rockbridge Capital uh, that's in the hospitality space and essentially um, is a uh, leadership innovation conference that benefits Pelotonia um, and so activates the private equity hospitality industry that um, you know cares about this fight against cancer and doesn't really know about Columbus um, and so um, a couple years ago we actually spun it out into its own entity governed by Pelotonia the Columbus partnership who I used to work for um, and Rockbridge to try and create this intimate experience that expands beyond just the hospitality industry um, and creates a whole new revenue stream for Pelotonia um, and elevates Columbus um, to be a convener uh, in thought leadership. And so our event um, is about a two and a half day event that happens right before Ride Weekend and rolls right into Ride Weekend. Um, obviously our friends at Pelotonia are trying to figure out what they're doing. Um, we're trying to figure out what we're doing and, and convening. Um, and right now we're, we're thinking about the hospitality industry that has been probably one of the hardest hit industries in, uh, uh, in you know in the country right now uh, many of Rockbridge's portfolio properties are no longer open and they've gone from 80% occupancy to 8% occupancy mm -hmm. um, if that and so thinking about how we can um, have some sort of virtual experience that can you know have the backs of those individuals um, as we, we pivot into what 2020 will look like thank you so much and for those of you on the call who aren't from Columbus Pelotonia is a one of the largest road bike races for raising money for cancer for the James Cancer Hospital here at Ohio State. So just a little background for you. All right, Laura Cook, you're up. And that's who I see across the top. Um, I'm Laura Cook. I run a company called Positive Foundry. Um, we basically teach people the skills that lead to flourishing. And um, most of our training is done live. I'm very familiar with a one and a half or two hour webinar format. But in April, I will be running a one and a half day uh, training format. So when I saw this come across, I was like, oh, thank you, Ruth. <laughs> You're like this universe speaking to me because I definitely need some input. Um, my most really thinking about how you drive engagement for longer periods of time online. Um, and um, so that's, I guess, my, my major wish here is um, just thinking about engagement and different ways in which we can um, make the learning um, as close to as engaging when we're in person, when we're apart, um, how you do partner type things. Um, anyway, all those kinds of things, which I, hopefully we'll get into some of that. But um, that's really where my brain is, is how do I, how do I pivot from being on, available in person and really feeling the audience to this format, which as much as we can smile at each other, still feels a little stilted, right? I mean, so how do we, um, anyway, how do we be human in this environment, so. Thank you. Rita. Hi everyone, my name is Rita Volpe. I am an independent consultant, but my background is in leadership development and change management, working primarily with retailers like REI, DSW, back when they were DSW, I guess. Um, I'm joining this call because part of both leadership development and change management is bringing people together. And so I'm curious and would love to share best practices around the art of bringing people together um, 
filling them with moments that they take away and remember and can action on. Great, thank you. And we have a guest, I don't know your name, I don't know everyone on here, so please introduce yourself and come on in. I assume you mean me. Yes. <laughs> um, my name is Reagan Mazak. Oh. Um, Hi, Reagan. Nice to see you. Yeah. <laughs> I see you now. Yes. <laughs> Um, I'm hiding out in the den off of my bedroom from my two kids right now and my two dogs who are making a lot of noise today. Um, I'm in Bexley, which is a suburb of Columbus, Ohio. Um, I'm the Associate Director of Development for Columbus School for Girls, which um, is the school that Ruth graduated from. Um, we, you know, serve a, a number of alumni, thousands of alumni, and our current parents and our current, current students were a um, preschool through 12th grade, all girls school. And so we're, this is a whole new thing for us. We are currently on spring break, but our um, virtual learning for our students starts Monday. Um, so that's gonna be a whole new thing. And then we have several events coming up this spring that we're no longer able to do, um, both fundraising events and engagement events. Um, we're even talking about postponing or canceling commencement. Um, so we're in a whole new world here and I'm just looking forward to learning from all of you today. Great, Reagan, glad you joined. Okay, Acacia Duncan. Hey, everybody. I am Acacia Duncan. I work with Articulation and with Ruth. And I'm here today because I probably, like most people, it sounds like on this call, just firmly believe in the power of gathering and the power of good communication and how it connects us to each other. And I don't think that that's disappeared in our new environment. So. I'm here to hopefully add a little inspiration, but also really gather a lot of inspiration from all of you and how we can continue bringing people together and helping them to communicate at a time that we really still need it. Thanks, Acacia. Yeah. Mr. Blancara, the king of gathering himself has joined the call. Go for it, Ben. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ben. I'm sitting in the basement of my house in Dublin, Ohio right now. Um, and I, uh, <clears throat> uh, damn glad to be here. Um, so, uh, I am, um, uh, I, I have two, a couple things. So I work for a couple of Columbus collaboratory and, and so in, in, in that world, part of learning how to do this is, uh, engagement with our customers and clients and model formats and, and try to figure out how to, how to do that in a, in a meaningful kind of way. The other component of my, in my world is helping to convene and, and sort of, uh, connect the technology and startup ecosystem here in town. So there's a literally 30 to 40 curators of uh, user groups that I work with. And, and so what I'm trying to do is convey to them. Here's some things we might want to do as we pivot to online and online world in particular. You know, there's literally 30 conferences of which at least a dozen have been canceled and are moved. And I'm trying to provide some guidance to those communities in order to, to keep up the momentum with, with engagement with, the, with sort of the user group community here in town. So that's why I'm here. You got a lot going on there. Thank you for joining, Ben. Nice to see you. Gregor. Wouldn't miss it. Gregor. Hi, Ruth. Hi, Laura <laughs> Cook. Can you hear me OK? We can. <laughs> um, I'm Gregor Gilliam, owner of Versatile Words, a content strategy practice that works with a wide range of local and national clients. And I'm talking to you from my home in Upper Arlington. Um, sidebar, I've supported both Pelotonia and Rockbridge, so it's awesome to see Siraj here. And I wanted to let him know I was just at the Eliza Jane in New Orleans a week ago, and it was surreal as they were basically closing it down. Um, it's, I don't know, the situation we're in is, is, um, is hard to describe. Um, I'm here because I'm a huge fan of Ruth and TEDx Columbus and I'm eager to learn more. I haven't been in a lot of multi-person virtual meetings like this, so I'm interested in all ideas because group collaboration is a big part of what I do with my clients. So thank you for doing this, and I am all ears. Gregor, nice to see you. So La, I'm gonna skip you because we're gonna let you kick off the next round, and I'm gonna go to Mark Henson, who is also a king of conveners of gatherings in town. We're glad you're here. Mark. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, good to see uh, some familiar faces on here as well. Um, I uh, own a business called Sparkspace here in Columbus. Uh, I'm actually not at Sparkspace. I'm actually at my cabin in Hideaway Hills, um, which is a great place to uh, social distance, um, to distance in general, period, uh, <laughs> social and otherwise. 
Um, and uh, Siraj, I, I feel your pain uh, in the hospitality business. Uh, all I do is face-to-face -face meetings. That's 100% uh, of my business, face-to-face -face meetings and, um, and training and team building and that kind of stuff. Um, and we went from 80% to zero, so um, like literally overnight. Um, so we're trying to kind of figure out where we go from here. Um, as a content provider and a trainer, I, I'm obviously curious about how to deliver content uh, effectively digitally. So much of what I do is so high touch and not high tech that um, I wonder how it translates. So that's part of what I'm hoping to pick up today is, is, is some ideas along those lines and contribute however I can to, to all of you. So thanks, Ruth. Mark, great to see you. Glad you're here. Um, right, before I turn this over to Law and let her introduce herself, I just um, want to say that uh, I'm grateful again for everyone to be here. And on the last call that Chris Anderson tried to host with Priya Parker, which didn't work out, it's kind of interesting, their tech doesn't work. Um, Priya made a plea, and I thought I'd just start here because we're going to kick off the rest of the next part of the meeting with Law that you always, uh, that you never make an assumption that the purpose of your meeting or gathering is obvious. Never assume why we're together. And the second question is, what's the real need in the community now? And I wanted everyone to introduce themselves because I think the need is obvious. But what we're trying to do here is knowledge share with those that have been um, through it in the last days or week and um, some thinking that I've been doing and hopefully helping you guys to spark, not that I have any answers, by the way, but as a host of TEDx and a host of trainings and, a and somebody who's been doing a lot of virtual work in the last few years, hopefully you can take away a few tidbits that we've been learning as we're real time trying to reinvent ourselves too. So with that, um, I think I'm gonna let La introduce herself. LaShondra is another close friend here in Columbus. And then after she introduces herself, um, I'm going to tee you up with a question. So go ahead and give us your two seconds, and then we'll get into your content there. All right, two seconds. What's up? Okay. <laughs> no, you get more than Wait, that. Okay, a few more than that? Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is LaShondra Baker. Everyone calls me La. I'm a, a senior manager of employee engagement at Cover My Meds, a company here in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, I've known Ruth for a really long time, been involved in the TEDx community for a long time. And so just admire her and her tenacity and her leadership. So anytime she says, can you do? And I'll say yes. I don't even, she doesn't even finish the sentence. She just says, can you? And I say yes. Okay. So I am here to support all of you in whatever you need. So LaShondra uh, posted on LinkedIn the day after I posted the note that all of you guys raised your hand about um, that she had just finished transitioning uh, exactly what we were talking about. And so without uh, spoiling it, what I want Law to do is tell us the context of what this meeting is that's recurring and uh, walk us through what you did to make it successful. And then I'm gonna have a few follow-ups for you. So we'll just do a, a little Q and A here and then we'll, we'll pass it to everyone for questions and then we'll keep going. I've got one other person I wanna make sure we hear from. So go ahead Law, tell us what you had to do in the last seven days. Sure, uh, we had to onboard 28 new hires to our organization all virtually because the quarantine started literally two weeks before they were supposed to start work. Um, so this is something that is um, really important to us because we create an experience when they come into our building. Um, I, I don't know how many of you know a lot about Cover My Meds, but um, our very fun, high energy, high workforce kind of environment is very fun and engaging and people love to be in our buildings. We give people like amazing lunches. We give them all this fun stuff. And so now we're telling them, sorry, you can't come, but we're gonna onboard you online. <laughs> In your own home so that was kind of weird for everyone uh just kind of even for us we were like oh uh wow how can we do this because one of the things we really want people to feel is that sense of belonging as soon as you walk through our doors um and that you are a part of our culture and that you are feeling the fun of our culture and so without being in the building that was going to be a new task for us is can we do it online and make people feel like they made the right choice to come to our organization and they feel the same kind of thing that people felt 
excuse me, coming into the doors. So it was a big task. Um, and our general orientation is two and a half days um, in the building. So we had to create a two and a half day virtual onboarding uh, orientation for our teams. So that's what we did this past Monday through Wednesday, first time. So La, I'm gonna uh, sort of prompt you to say that probably there was uh, what I call the content that's like, you know, in some respects, it's paying the bills, stuff that you have to transfer, benefits, yeah. HR information, how to use the laptops. You sent every, by the way, you shipped them a kit or yes. you sent them all a kit of their laptops and technology yes. that they needed. Talk to us just about how you did that really quick. Sure, yeah. So I partnered with our shared technology team and we sent everyone laptop, mouse, mouse pad, chargers. Some people got monitors, headsets. Like we just literally had an itinerary based on your role, what you get. And so last Monday, Monday the 17th, we were in the office and shipping out 28 boxes of materials to everyone's home. So everyone via FedEx, so standard overnight, so people can make sure they got it in enough time that they would be ready for the following Monday to start. Um, you know, based on just employment law and in our, our company rules, they couldn't get their credentials to sign on until the Monday they started. So we had to make sure we had correct uh, personal email addresses and information for them so that they could get sent the credentials Monday morning before they started with our 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 call, which was a blue we use blue jeans uh, video chat. So I sent them all blue jeans invitations to start Monday morning, 8:30. Um, and I told them you will get your credentials just shortly before that call so that then they could uh, get their computers logged in and log into blue jeans. And the very first meeting we had was with our shared technology to get them up and running and, and add it to our VPN, um, all of our VDI stuff, and then get them um, started with their technology. And I'm gonna revisit this notion about technology in a second, because um, we don't have the technology in our homes to do some of the things we need to do. So that's one bucket. You've got content that's already finished that you just transferred online, but just talk to us a little bit deeper. When you and I spoke, one of the things that really struck me was the notion of how do you transfer your culture from yeah. in-person to online? And so tell us how you decided what got transferred and what did you do to yes. express that culture effectively online? Just take a few minutes to go sure. there. Sure. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So like Ruth said, there's a lot of content that's already developed, like, you know, them going through benefits and that kind of thing. But we also do a deeper dive into all of our business units. So they get a little bit of the company information with that. But infused within that are cultural things that make it fun, that they feel connected and engaged. Um, and that starts from the very beginning when we do introductions to everyone. Um, we had a virtual meet and greet where leaders of our company came online and introduced themselves to the team. And that was something that's super important for people. Um, we did something so simple as what made you want to come to cover my meds and be a part of our team? And then a fun question like, what is the coolest vacation you ever went on? And so we went around with everyone talking about their vacations. And what that also does is say, oh, I went to Germany. Oh, and somebody's like, oh, I went to Germany on my honeymoon. Oh, this. And so then they start automatically making connections to each other and feeling like they belong in this conversation. Um, and so we did that throughout the two and a half days. I mean, we did one where we did a, a like an MTV version of Cribs. They're like, here, this here's my whole work from home space. Look <laughs> at this great desk. This came from my grandmother's house a long time ago. And so it's like that kind of fun thing to get people into your space and, and make you feel kind of good with that. We did an epic rock, paper, scissors uh, competition that was massive um so two of us split people up so then we had, she had 28 people so i had 14 she had 14 and then we broke it down into sets of twos semi-finals down to the final and then we came back together for the last two final rounds which was super fun and engaging um we did a show us your favorite picture who's in this picture and and why is this picture important to you um we had everything from people's children to their fur babies to their grandparents who had passed away um so we just had that really kind of that conversation to kind of connect people um, we did another where we did, um, if you had any item that you were going to bring to your desk at work when you come back to the office, what is that item and what is the importance of it? Um, so people shared that um, together. And then we did a Kahoot's trivia game where everybody could sign up on their smartphones and I had a Kahoot screen on my screen. And we had everything from Cover My Meds trivia that they'd already heard from the earlier part of the time to pop culture, like rank 
Taylor Swift's boyfriends from earliest to most recent. I mean, it was just fun stuff like that. They got people kind of just laughing and, and being engaged, that kind of thing. And that is very indicative to our culture is just like, how do we infuse that fun in the hard work that we do every day? That's awesome. Thank you for that. Was there, um, was there anything you did around your values that was different? Meaning, I know you guys are driven, your culture is driven by values. Was there anything specific that you pulled in to the virtual meeting that helped you communicate those values uniquely or differently? I, we didn't talk about that before, but I sure. presume you did. Um, well, the funny part is, so we have, we have a whole presentation about culture and community giving because that's such a big part of who we are as an organization. And we talked about how our core values were even derived and they were derived from our employees. So we let them know from day one, like you are a cultural ambassador. You walk through the door, you walk, you can come online, you are a part of our organization. So how we move as a company um, is driven by you. So you are now an active part of this. So we tell them that, and then we give them our five core values, um, be yourself, do the right thing, embrace challenges, results matter, and be selfless. And the first, literally day one, we're embracing challenges. We are now all online, 30 of us talking on this com conversation now, and this is new for all of us. So we might make a mistake and we're gonna learn from it. And that's what we do. We innovate and we go along. And so they knew that from day one. You know, we just, we always just talked about it and we talked about, you know, them being focused and coming on board that, you know, we trust them as a, we treat adults like they, like adults and we trust you to do the thing. If you need help, speak up. There's no bad question, dumb question. You know, we, if you've never experienced something, you won't know how to do it. So ask the question, seek help, give us feedback. We want to be better for you. And so we just kept instilling that in them from the first day all the way to the end. Um, and that was really powerful for us. Um, and even with our president, he came and had a virtual lunch with us and he said, any, all questions are on the table. So they asked him both personal and professional questions and he answered them all. And it was engaging and, and it was pure magic. There was a lot of people who said, I've been in companies my whole life. I've never had the president even say hello to me, less or spend 30 minutes with me talking about his personal life. So that was really very cool for us. So and he told his, so he told his sort of who I am story. That's right. And they asked him any questions. Like even he had this, he had this beautiful color of wall, of a wall paint on the back and everybody's like, I love that color. What's that color? Can you send us a swatch? Like what's going on? Like it was really funny and he was just super engaging with them. And he's talking about how he loved to cook for his family. And he's a, he's a smoker and a barbecuer. He, he loves to smoke meat. And we threw a, a challenge down. Somebody said, well, I do brisket. So when you come back to town, let's do a cook off. And we're like, yeah, let's do it. Like, you know, he was totally into it. And so people really loved it. It was such a, a fun and, and wonderful way to invite people into our company. Um, so actually, uh, Acacia asked a question, did the president participating in the virtual, was that different than what he would have done in person? Yeah, well, the interesting part is he, because he, he lives right now in Nashville, Tennessee, and he travels back and forth. He's in the process of moving to Columbus, but there's many times during our orientation that his schedule just doesn't mesh. He can come say hello maybe in the very beginning for the meet and greet, but he doesn't have like 30 minutes dedicated time to be with us. And so this was the first time he could actually do it. And he loved it so much and we loved it so much. We went to his executive assistant and we we're like, put it on the calendar now. This is what we're doing. Cover it. It's like protect it. Like this is what we're doing. That's and he true. was totally down with it. Even in his uh, message today to the team, he says, I'm going to make good on my barbecue. I promise. He actually said that to the whole staff today. So we got to hold it to him. So that's pretty great. So La, if you would be so kind, there's a few that have, would love the list. I've made a list. You went, you sure. whipped, whipped through them, but um, maybe we'll send you what we heard and you can add back and we'll, we'll forward that to the group. So yeah. there were some <clears throat> terrific ones on that. So thank you. That was really energizing and some really um, great ideas. I mean, we're, we're here to figure it out. Um, I'm just going to transition for a quick second and uh, ask anyone, do they have any questions for La first before I um, go to another, just a transition to Q&A is what I wanted to say. So I think there's enough of us that you can just unmute yourself and talk if there's anyone that wants to ask a question. When, oh, oh am I talking? Oh yeah, okay, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, when when they asked questions of the president, were they speaking or were they doing it in the chat box and then answering them? 
no, they were just speaking to him. I said, who has a question? And someone says, oh, I have a question. And, and they'll say, whatever. And he'll say, oh, Travis, who, what, what, where, what team are you going to be working on? And so he engaged right back with them before he even answered. He's like, oh, well, welcome to the team. And then he'll answer whatever question. So yeah, it was live, not, right. not chat. Just them asking a question. He hear their voices and they hear, hear his. So it's pretty cool. That's great. Yeah, I have a we, uh, this is a, oh, go ahead. We have the 100 CEOs in one room or a virtual room and sending them a kit beforehand with, a, I'm thinking like a ping pong paddle with green and red uh, so that they can vote virtually. <laughs> that, that's a great idea for the kit ahead of time. So thanks a lot. We'll definitely use that tip. Of course, sure. Absolutely. So, can I just, I'm just going to, uh, Gregor, actually, Gregor, go ahead. Is that you that wanted to ask a question? Yeah, just a real quick one. So we saw Chris Anderson struggle with the technology side. And I'm just wondering if Law did a trial run or two. And how did you troubleshoot and work the kinks out knowing that something that important uh, would work right the first time? Yeah, so well, the cool thing is we use uh, Blue Jeans for our all staff meeting. And that's like, all 1400 people. So we've used this on small scales and large scales in the past. So we kind of know what works. The delay, we know there's a certain amount of a delay in like sometimes hearing the words, like your mouth is still moving and the words are still coming. So that the only difficult part with that was honestly the rock, paper, scissors thing because we had to see people doing it. And that, that was the only part. Everything else flowed really well. And all of the presentations that we did, we sent PDF versions of them to everyone so that they have them for resources to look back on afterwards. So they were live action, asking questions real time, and then they had the materials later to be able to refer back to. La, I have a question for you. Yeah. I've, in my experience with which I haven't done a ton of virtual training, but one of the difficulties that I encounter is creating that environment where people will feel really comfortable jumping in at any moment. Like everyone's trying to be polite, Midwest polite, right? I'm not going to step on anyone's toes. Yeah. So I'm wondering how maybe at the beginning, what you guys did to set up that environment and make the audience really understand that that was the expectation for the event. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a lot of me because I'm very high energy if you can't already <laughs> tell on this call. So um, I kind of, I, I always say I throw my vulnerability out first and I talk to people and I create that safe space because I think it's super important um, to have the right facilitator doing these things because it is so important to create um, that environment that you want people to jump into. Um, and then initially we started with making sure we wanted to make sure all voices were heard. So for certain things, we kind of, I went by a list. So I said, I want to make sure everyone's heard and we won't miss anybody. So I'm going to go through this list this way. So the first, I went through it first way, just alphabetical order we make sure we hit everybody then I started switching it up so people wouldn't be like oh well, I'm always going to go first or I'm always going to go last I'm like no you're not I'm gonna switch it up because I even though when you're going through lists people still need to have some unpredictability to know how to respond to it so I throw that in there too so that's kind of that's, that's just me I'm, I'm out there and I do that um, but people just started after you started speaking you heard people speak and people kind of affirm them of what they said they felt more and more comfortable in saying stuff and I think that's the environment like I'm always trying to encourage people after they say something to make them feel like they did good and what they said was important and that kind of thing then they build that confidence to be able to speak more freely as they go along great Lots. Oh, sorry, one, one more question, then I'm going to shift gears to a different topic. Keep going. Okay. Go ahead. Who's up? Miss Rita. Rita. Um, yeah, so I'm very curious. I often think that meetings start before the meeting. And so you talked about sending technology out, but was there anything else that you sent in advance that sparked that fun or created those cultural connections or the things that you really wanted people to be thinking about or feeling? Yes. So initially I sent them an introduction email, just telling them, Hey, we're going to do this virtually. This is our first time. We're going to learn together. Here's the things you need to know for day one and I'll be following up with you. But then I also, which was different than I do for our normal class, I wrote handwritten notes to every, all 28 of those people. And then I put in um, my favorite stickers that we, we do, a, we have a big sticker culture at Cover My Med. So I put in a bunch of stickers in the envelopes. And so I mailed them all personal letters from me that, that was saying, I'm so excited that you chose to bring your talents and treasures to Cover My Meds and I can't wait to meet you. Um, and that was something that was different, but I wanted it to be distinctive for them to feel like, even though they're not in the building, that they are important and special 
And I wanted to personally tell them that. And so that was really well received, really well received. Great question, Rita. To that point, one of the uh, points I wanted to make was um, the notion of technology and also the what do people need in their spaces to be successful at participating. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just going to share a two minute case study of something that my team is currently um, involved in. It's not about a virtual meeting, but it, it plays with regard to the technology. So we actually have eight people participating. Uh, they were supposed to participate in a live uh, pitch for a large co contract. The pitch got moved from person to virtual and now from virtual to recorded. So we have eight executives in eight different places who have no clue how to appropriate, re appropriately record themselves. Um, recording what will be a 90 minute pitch assembled in eight different people in 12 different pieces. So we're collecting content, assembling it and pitching it back out or publishing it back out, but we had to send a kit to each person. So we sent a halo light on a tripod and a clip of a TV, um, sorry, a phone clip so that everyone had at least the right tech, uh, you know, it's 30 bucks plus a microphone. So when they're recording, they have a chance of being successful. They'll now have that kit for every future sort of video call these are leaders in the company. Um, but yesterday, just to demonstrate how hard things are, I had to get on a call and like walk somebody through how to assemble their tripod. I'd walk somebody else through on how to delete content on their phone, um, how to upload something from their phone to Google Drive. I mean, I probably spent two and a half hours just being a tech support. So things are harder and they take longer when you start to ask people to use technology, whether it's recording in this case, or um, the WAF that just came into my office, which is great, sorry. <laughs> or, you know, just even getting on a Zoom call. So making sure that there's ample time, just like I sent to everyone today, we'll be on a little bit early. If you're not familiar, make sure you, you jump on. So um, so that's, a, that's one piece about technology. The second is, as we saw from the TED thing, they obviously didn't have success earlier this week. And so they pre-recorded their interview with Priya and then they couldn't play it. So they'll post it, I'm sure. But we've, um, just a second call I was on yesterday with, um, there were about 40 TEDx organizers from about 28 different countries on a call yesterday for an hour, sort of um, talking about doing virtual TEDx events. And th there was a unanimous um, agreement that you should as much as possible pre-record content that you know is already existing so that if you have a tech glitch with your Wi-Fi, you've got a backup. Now that's exactly what they did for TED today and it didn't work, but they were also, if you heard the Chris talk, they're also trying to cross platforms. So they were trying to take something that was um, being stupid on one platform and send it over to, uh, from blue jeans into Facebook and that wasn't working. So, but the notion that you've always got, and they'll have some of the TEDx events that are already starting to do their virtuals will have, um, pre-recorded talks, and they'll have them in the queue as a backup in case the live talk doesn't work. So not to rely on live technology is one of the takeaways that I'm <laughs> pulling from everything we're doing this week. So I wanna shift now to a second. I'm gonna ask Ann Blum to spend just a few minutes talking about um, virtual learning and timing. And this has been something that's been on my mind and a question that I've had, and hopefully everybody shares the same question, which is how long can somebody sit on their ass and learn something <laughs> before they get bored, tired, or they fall asleep? And um, sorry to be so blunt, but that's where we are today. And Anne has some really great perspectives on this as a learning designer and also somebody who's done a lot of online stuff. So Anne, give us your, uh, your, your, your top line on this topic. Um, thank you. So uh, we generally like to say um, to think about online learning or virtual learning in increments and to, um, if it can be between say 60 and 90 minutes, 90 at the absolute outside, um, uh, there's not a lot of research done about how many total hours in a day for adults. Um, 
obviously this is a very new experience, new situation for most people. What we've been telling our clients is about four hours a day, which is what's recommended for high school students and college students. And so we think that that's the best sort of um, uh, reasonable comparison, I guess. The other thing, um, and I know some of you mentioned that uh, you have big conferences coming up. So a couple of the things that uh, we recommend or to think about is ways that you can um, think about those one or two days as having multiple different learning experiences. So maybe you have some that are a live stream conference and then some where you either pre-assign or have some way that you break people out into very small chat groups, two, three, or four, so that they can really have a meaningful dialogue and then having them get back together to share. Um, you know, we all know that in terms of best practices of adult learning, adults like to share what they know. And so to really think about how can you create those, um, those opportunities. There's also, as Ruth did with us today, um, an opportunity to have pre-work that is a different kind of learning experience, right? So she had us listen to something and then we were all to come together. Um, you know, and so whether you have everyone read a case study or watch something, but really thinking about how can you um, have a lot of different learning opportunities. I know, Helen, you mentioned um, that you've got a group of 100, which is a lot. Um, and to think about, uh, can you, are there opportunities where you can have multiple things going on at the same time so that people have choice, right? So, you know, maybe from, from one to two on day one, you have four different pre-recorded videos and that um, people can spend that hour watching one of the four and then obviously you post the other three and give them opportunities to, to watch them offline. One of the other things um, that we've been giving a lot of thought to is what's the collateral material. Um, there's certainly a temptation to just say, oh, well, uh, we do our participant guides in Word um, so we'll just send Word documents or we'll send PDFs of the Word documents because that seems reasonable. Um, and while it is reasonable, there's also an opportunity to really take advantage of the medium. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I'm doing for someone is uh, to create a um, OneNote, which is a Microsoft tool, um, where you can have multiple different things and you can hang, um, you can hang links on it, you can, you can embed video in it, and so it's it's a it's almost like a, a meeting in a box kind of an idea. Um, so those are just my ideas. It's almost like a dashboard and of all the resources that might be used. Your OneNote example, absolutely, and um, and also it's got space for note taking. Great, uh, I appreciate that, and. And I had a chance to talk before the call too, and she really got my head around the three levels. And I don't know if you said it like this, but the three levels that you, you wanna to get to when you're doing any sort of learning or content sharing, the first is get their attention, the second, their engagement, and the third, their investment. And the more you commented that if you get them to do something in advance, then you at least have them engaged even before they're on the call. If you have somebody do a cold start, as I would say, to a call, and they've done nothing, their chances of being engaged are probably less than if they've come with some, like, I was invited to a book club yesterday. I didn't read the book. I couldn't get on the call. It was a little, um, it didn't work for me, but I will do the next one. But I was reluctant to get on that call without reading the book. If I was on the call and I'd read the book, then, you know, it's like a book club. You, you know, you're going to be more engaged in the conversation. But the notion of investment, that they really are invested in the learning, investing in um, the continuation of what you're trying to do. So questions for Anne. She's got a lot of knowledge that she didn't share. So have at it if there's anybody that wants to dig into learning aspects. Anne, all right. Do you tip, well, do you tip, Anne, do you typically do the, um, the chat groups um, 
like using technology at the same time? So like Zoom, you know, those Zoom breakout groups, or are you kind of relying on them to get together and have their own chats during the time allowed and then come back together? So um, sort of a little of both. Um, that if you want them to really have a meaningful conversation, you may say, okay, we're going to talk for these 60 minutes. Now for the next 60 minutes, you guys talk, you guys talk, you guys talk, and then we'll all come back together. Um, sometimes that can work a, a little bit um, easier than having a lot of different um, Zoom breakout rooms or Zoom chat rooms. Um, it also, uh, depending on how many people you have in your facilitation team, um, if you stagger, and also it depends on how much time you have to spread out your conference, but um, if you can stagger the time, then you or your facilitation team can be part of those smaller group conversations. But one of the things that we think is really important is that you as the organizer um, determine who's in each chat room, right? You don't leave it to circumstance or happenstance, I guess is the better word. And Laura, you know how to, that you can either do random chats in yeah. Zoom or assigned. So you know that there's that choice. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Um, other questions before I get to anything that you Ruth, can I just jump in with one idea that I um, I had uh, I can tell you that um, the client has not yet adopted it but um, I pitched it this morning which is so you know all of us are facilitators and we know that a converse uh, common facilitation gambit is you say okay now everyone at this table and everyone at that table and what I suggested to them that they do is as part of that kit before the session send out different colored shirts so that if you had a, a thing like this, you could say, okay, blue team, green team, um, that it would be sort of a visual way to build that um, connection um, if you're doing the Zoom platform. That's great. All right. Uh, questions that are on your mind that anyone in the hive might be able to answer that you're really struggling, I'm, I want you to be vulnerable and, and come out with, what are you really struggling with right now in terms of your own transition from you know, person to virtual, whatever, anything's game here. And I can wait a minute while you think, it's okay. You know, for me, my biggest issue is we have all of these leaders who don't use computers. They have other people answer their emails. They don't really use their laptops very often. And that's all, that's the only way that they're going to be able to communicate now. So my biggest challenge is getting a 12 year old boy into every one of their homes so that they can hook their computers up <laughs> and do it. That's the biggest challenge for us. You know, Helen, what, what brings to mind is, you know, there could be some uh, some fun and culture and games infused in that, that like that's maybe, you know, everyone gets to, um, there's points or a prize or something for little, little tiny things that they get to do or show that they can do and make it sort of, you may not get, um, there was a professor down the street that, um, or actually it's somebody that Acacia's coaching, I've had several professor conversations about their transition this week going online, that everything takes a lot longer. So the content that you thought you might be transferring during that time, you know, you might wanna think about cutting it in half and using uh, the other time for those cultural touch points, the technology glitches, the bathroom breaks, you know, it's gonna take longer to get people reassembled. So that might be one way to think about it as opposed to having total control over the agenda and how much content and how, you know, reduce your expectations of what you think you can achieve until everyone has done it once and is online and is ready to go with, you know, knowing how the tools work. Um, so one of the things we tried to do this week was make every, those eight executives do a test. We didn't have a lot of adoption it was really, it's been a little frustrating, right? 
um, Helen knows because it's actually in her business, but um, <laughs> different in her other division. But you know, we wanted to make sure they knew how to use the phone, how to record something, how to save it, how to upload it, how to share it, and then how to delete it so they would have more room on it. Those are there's you know, in the mind of a you know, if you if you take the executive processing mind, there's probably 17 discrete steps. You know, starting and stopping and transferring in there that they've never done before and was totally overwhelming, but to all of us is very, so not to take, um, don't take for granted that your audience is going to need a few rounds of this. Um, I, could al I could almost see Ruth like uh, sending people recipes for these kind of things, like not assuming that they, ha they come with that knowledge, but give them the recipe. They've never baked bread before. Most of us haven't had to do that, right? And they're coming on to this without any experience. So thinking of a different way to share that ahead of time so that they have something to look at and follow. And I think too, maybe having options of, you can either do this, this, or this, so that people can kind of measure what is mm -hmm. comfortable for them. Because not everybody's going to be able to full force go into something that they've never done before. So give them baby steps, like a you know a small, medium, large. If you want to do something or whatever, kind of weigh it and give them options, and then people can choose what works best for them. I like that, especially because you you know you may. I not also think it's an opportunity. I'm oh, sorry. Ruth. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Ann. I also think it's an opportunity to sort of meet people where they are. So um, you know. Participating on a Zoom via cell phone maybe not may not be the greatest, but if people are comfortable using their cell phone, at least it's a start, right? And so thinking about uh, well, what technology do you know how to use, and and going from there uh, instead of the other way around, That's a good point. or in addition to the other way around, I guess is more appropriate. So the thank you. I want to just, um, in the last few minutes we have, as a, out of respect for time, is just to talk about feedback and how to engage. You know, one of the things Priya mentioned on the call was, how do you not create meaningful conversation, but really elevate the conversation and, and get people engaged in ways? And I know for folks like Ben, who are constantly hosting conversations um, with user groups and different populations, you know, how do you get them to do more than just show up? Um, so tips and tricks and things that might create the environment, culture, and the setup where people are willing um, to elevate beyond just the surface, you know, components or, or what's on their topic. So I just sort of throw that out there in pulling maybe what we do in real life and how that transfers into a virtual. So maybe what would you do if you um, were trying to get people to really dig deeper into a more meaningful conversation? Um, and what does that then look like virtually? Anyone have thoughts on that? I know I'm throwing it out there. Um, well, I've, I've always found that most people have a point of view on something. They just are reticent to share it. And that if you give them permission by calling them and asking for their specific input versus a broad call, it, it can start the ball rolling in, in meaningful kind of ways, especially calling out folks that don't normally get called on and in, in, in prepping some of our senior execs to shut the hell up, right? This is not just about you. This is about creating conversation and people will listen to you because you, you talk and no one's going to talk over you. Perhaps that's not the point. The point is we want to get everyone else engaged. And so having folks sort of call, call, ask people for a very specific, and perhaps if you have some background on some folks point of view, or you've had a conversation, you could say, Hey, you know, Ruth, we had this conversation last week. It seems to be, uh, adjacent to this space and hear some of your thoughts. Can you give us your you know, point of view on this? So I think you got to call out folks. Okay. And if you create, if you can set the stage of calling out folks that don't normally talk because they're quiet and their voice gets heard, then others feel comfortable with that happening. Yeah, I do think the introvert um, piece to this is challenging. You know, who, who normally don't speak up in a live session let alone on a you know they get to hide it's good they're yeah. very, they're very happy right now right well i think the other component <laughs> is um uh chat the chat functions yep. create some liberation for some folks because they don't actually have to say anything right and so suggesting to folks you know hey you know you can talk but please dialogue via via chat 
you know, it, it, you can have multi-threaded conversation, I guess is the point. And, and it's, it's okay to have multi-threaded conversation. I like that you said it that way, Ben, because Ruth's question had started to make my mind think about how else can I invite them to participate? For those people, not everyone is someone who likes to speak up and they have mm -hmm. ideas to share. So mm -hmm. how do you create the atmosphere for that in the same way we might in a classroom deliberately in certain moments of working quietly? There are going to be mm -hmm. people on these in these learning experiences that will need a moment of quiet for mm -hmm. their brain to process what's going on. And so being deliberate about that in the same way virtually as you might in person, I think is mm -hmm. really valuable. Acacia, mm -hmm. I just want to build on what you just said. I wrote down um, call out introverts, chat functions, breakout rooms, and then physically breaking. I mean, I think that sometimes people just need, as you, Acacia, you and I know, you just need to walk away and think about it and come back. And so giving people a chance to have space like they do, um, you know, Ted's, not that we're only about Ted here, but just because we're building from that previous call, you know, half of their programming is not content. It is space in which to, rest, talk, iterate, play. Um, so there might be a game that you let people go play um, for a little bit just to break, their, break up the monotony. Um, I know my son is constantly sending me game requests. You know, I'm sure there's some adult games out there, word game, something. We hadn't talked about that at all, but some sort of gamification, play function, playing um, to let people rest from the, the need to perform. Great idea. The other thing that I would add, this is Rita, I don't know if I can jump in here, but yes, um, please do, please. It's allowing people to, and this depends on the meeting and the purpose, of course, but the permission to check in. I mean, there's so many updates happening so rapidly. Companies are having layoffs and furloughs and salary reductions, and there, there's a lot of change. And so depending on the meeting, giving people space to check in and to be vulnerable, and this is where you want your leaders to actually speak up and say, like, hey guys, here's how I'm feeling. Here's what's going on with my family. Here's what's going on with my community. And just having a, just a moment, and I've used this with team meetings when there's a lot of change going on, but just the permission to unload for a second then allows people to be very present. And that can be powerful, again, depending on, on what the purpose of the meeting could be. Yeah, that's a, it's a great reminder, Rita, in all of the facilitations that I've been trained or do, it's always the first thing you let people do because if you can't get that out, then you can't get to the work. So that notion of a check-in is, is great. Um, anyone that we speak, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna toss in a couple of ideas. Uh, okay. One is the, the absolute need for a facilitator mm -hmm. um, and facilitation skills, I think are gonna be in high demand uh, for these types of calls. Because I mean, just looking at your screen right now, we've taken the typical conference table and we've just flattened it completely, right? Everybody's at the same level, everybody's in their, everybody's face, um, and there's no hierarchy unless, you know, you count the top of the screen and the bottom of the screen, but it, it's all kind of randomized. So somebody's gonna need to take control. Um, I've been on too many calls and trainings where it's been sort of the Wild West because everybody has a voice and everybody seems to be equal. And it doesn't mean that somebody needs to be like in charge and telling everybody what to do, but somebody needs to facilitate, I think, to make these conversations as effective as they can. And or um, have, uh, have a team of people that are working on the facilitation together. Uh, for instance, while I'm talking to you, I can't, I'm not paying attention to the chat, um, but right. there may be some good things happening in the chat. So if someone else is assigned to watch the chat and bring up the questions that are coming uh, while I'm presenting or while I'm talking, then we get to kind of cover all of those bases. Um, and I think I see too many people trying to do it all. And then it's constantly like, oh, let me check the chat. Oh, let me come back. And then it's all, it's all stilted and it could be so much smoother if we just assigned roles like you would do in, a, in an effective face-to-face -face meeting. Somebody would take notes, somebody would you know, facilitate. Uh, other people might have other roles, that kind of thing. So my two cents. Mark, just building on that, one of the things that Ann and I talked about yesterday with learning environments, and, the, and it relates specifically to this, is that there's always a facilitator and always a producer, to, just to use some terms for you, meaning that there's always somebody that's doing the back end stuff. Because um, if something goes wrong, I mean, we've been 
we've been practicing this for a few months, which is why I got on the call today. And I said, Helmet, your co-host, let's go. And he knows exactly how to monitor the chat, how to do that. And that's a trained role and not just somebody, I mean, there's not been much chat today, but we're, you know, <laughs> but, to, but to pay attention, just the same as if I'm in a, a, a real facilitation, I can't, I can't, you know, check the, it's hard for me enough to stop and check the temperature in the room. <laughs> so thank you for that. And then um, the facilitation skills, you know, it's, it's going to be critical. You know, I, I'm thinking about your meetings um, that all of you were thinking about having and not just somebody that has a lot to say, but really understands how to draw out from others. Okay, anyone else have something? Cause we can, we can stay on here. If you got to jump, please jump. I want to give you license and freedom. If you want to keep chatting, I've got till three. Helen, you're going to go. Nice to see yep. you. Bye guys. Thanks everyone. Hopefully that was helpful for you. Um, okay. too. So we'll, clo we'll, close, we'll close the formal part. Anybody that wants to ask any pressing questions, we can hang out for a few more minutes, but I'll, say I'll send the list of activities that we did to you, Ruth, and you can distribute it to the team. You're the best, Law. Thank you, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Take yes. care. Thank you. Gotta go back to work. All right. I Thanks, gotta, Laura. All right, we'll take, yes, Helmet. I want to throw out a quick technical question for Ben and people. Um, have you found any better platforms other than Zoom? Anything that's even more reliable or more user-friendly? Well, um, depends on, on what you want to do. Um, there, most most companies are using Teams now, and and Teams is 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 pretty stable. Team, Teams is 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 pretty stable and in in, in, in relative robust. And there's a Microsoft uh, Live Teams, which is for more webinary kind of things. So there's a component. And most people already own it. <laughs> that's 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 a component there. Um, but the, uh, then there's then there's webinar sort of very specific webinar platforms like bright talk that you can use because what's good about those is those are designed for webinars and if you put your do a webinar it stays in their in the inventory of webinars that people can access and it's recorded um so it, so those are those are a couple of the platforms that that we've seen ben did you say bright talk bright talk thank you yeah yeah, so that, I mean, there's a, there's a series of platforms for webinars that's, that are commercial platforms that have, it's pretty robust. And one of the things about Bright Talk is they send out a weekly, you know, uh, or some kind of newsletter to folks that are subscribed to the sales and marketing channel, the IT channel, the cybersecurity channel. So if you are creating content that you want folks to see that are asynchronous from your webinar, because it's on demand, it, it, it creates a, you know, a book that someone can pull for, you know, when you're doing uh, th those kind of things versus uh, synchronous conversations in, sure. in, in meetings. So they're actually publishing too. That's right. They're, they're publishing. They're, they're publishing. So that, that's, that's, a, that's a, 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 for some companies, that's what you want. You want, you want to create a library of things that people can view a Previously, versus heard one yet. on, you know, so synchronous conversation. Hold on, go ahead. Are there any security concerns on any of those platforms, like some of them there than others? I think Ben just throws up on us. If there was security, I think he left. No, he's still. He, I just lost. I just lost him. But if there was security concerns, anyone would know it would be Ben because that's all they're doing these days. <laughs> um, maybe he'll come back and answer that. He probably wouldn't, just knowing the collaboratory and their focus on info, InfoSec, they likely would not be recommending or talking about this if they didn't have security. Hey Ruth, I'll throw in, uh, we use a, a, a product called EverWebinar and Webinar Jam. Um, it does a live webinar feature, but also you can archive things and then you can send them out evergreen or, or use them in whatever kind of training you want. It'll also post things to YouTube if you want to do that as well. Um, and then internally, we've just been using uh, uh, Google Meet since we were all on G Suite for our, we run our email and everything through there. Uh, so Google Meet is the business version of Google Hangouts and it's worked fairly well. Um, I kind of like Zoom a little bit better. Uh, one nice thing about the webinar software is it allows you to create 
polls and questions and things like that. So if you wanted to engage people um, in, in uh, you know, that type of activity, you can have everybody answer, you can actually pop up the results, that kind of stuff. So if you needed to do voting or you needed to do um, some sort of polling or that kind of thing, uh, a lot of the webinar software has that kind of functionality built in, which is really good for engagement. Mark, you may not know that Zoom has that now too. Oh, does it? Okay, yeah. Um, you you uh, you preload it and it goes, uh, and then you pull it into your meeting. It's there's it's pretty simple. So it's Perfect. been developed yeah. new. So just FYI, it's I don't That's know. If it's, I don't know if it's as robust as these, um, but it does. It they they in the last year we've been using Zoom for several years, and in the last year or two they've been really upping their game, and they were right too because <laughs> who knew this would be the you know, breakout rooms didn't exist until the last year. The polling was pretty new, um, the backdrops and stuff. So it's been nice to see them um, evolve. Any other pressing questions for those of you who, or maybe just want more social interaction, like I <laughs> just didn't stay connected. Reagan, did we get some of your questions answered? I know your population's really, you know, different and just, you know, uh, decentralized in terms of alumni and, um, yeah, it's unique and we have a lot of different things obviously going on. I mean, our biggest thing right now is what to do with Alumni Weekend um, and just how to engage so many people across, you know, so many generations um, that can't be present. We have some really um, important celebrations like 50th reunions and things like that. And they're just, you know, rightly so very disappointed they can't come and, and visit in person. So we're working on um, some sort of visual. I'm sorry, virtual alumni weekend, uh, maybe a recording from the head of school, the state of the school, and an announcement of awards and things like that. But then we're also um, looking for just a variety of ways to engage alumni, parents, students over the next couple of months. So I actually thought Priya's um, presentation was really valuable, um, gave me a lot of really great ideas for creative ways we can we can connect. We're really fortunate to have 550 um strong smart amazing girls and young women that pull on the heartstrings of our constituents so now we're just um trying to figure out how to um how to share that with the community from a distance and then when also it's appropriate um you know we also have a bottom line and we have fundraising goals and so obviously right now we've halted all of that but with our end of um, fiscal year coming up um, June 30th, we're also trying to balance um, when it, if and when it's appropriate to re-engage fundraising efforts for the school as well. And then we have on the flip side, our admissions department is in the, the um, midst of admission season. So enrollment for next year is a question. So there's just a lot of, a lot of moving parts. Um, can I just give you in the, uh, with the spirit of, um, a quick brainstorm based on what you just said and what we've been hearing as I don't have a, I don't have a reunion year, but even if I didn't have a reunion, since even if I don't, I have a little craving to see my classmates and yeah. so to set up a virtual call for every class. Yeah. I don't know if that's something you're talking about and I'm happy to help you brainstorm with that. But it would also be, it would also be great to have a, you know, a, a live call with Jennifer for the whole school. Um, I wrote that down after this during this session yeah and also i think it would be amazing to have uh, maybe a panel discussion with current students where anybody can um, dial in and have a facilitated i'm not a big fan of panel discussions in general mm -hmm. but i think to have um, some preluded stories from students on a call where people could dial in and listen and ask questions um, it could be after jennifer but anyway, so not to not to distract from everyone else, but I think that the need for um, I would be delighted to get on a call with my class, and you know, if it was for an hour, That's just great. and um, yeah, you know, kind of like the kind of like the virtual um, newsletter. Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't have my list in front of me, but that's all very helpful so thank and, you for sharing and you that could, and you could ask everybody to wear whatever like gear they have left over yeah you know um, i know i would love to send out red gold t-shirts that would be amazing um did you guys hear the idea that chris anderson shared about the um or that she had about the seven songs that priya had you could actually preload 
um, favorite songs of the 80s or 90s. Um, in some of those, like to have somebody actually DJ a dance party in the middle of every call with like three or four favorite songs <laughs> from your year. I can imagine yeah. what you would come up with. <laughs> like, you want to see me dance, but that could be, you know, that the facilitator could say, let's take a break and, you know, whatever. I don't know if it's how cheesy that is, but that, you know, we would probably. I love it. Or even a karaoke moment, which I love even more. Yeah. Um, yeah. Personally, you don't want to hear me sing, but I do like karaoke. So, you know, yeah. back to that notion of fun, engaging, um, uh, engaging things. So did someone else yeah, have something great. to say? I got my, I got myself up. Mark, make sure to unmute yourself. Unmute. There we go. Unmute. Um, I, uh, I couldn't watch the Priya thing. I waited and waited and waited. And it's bailed. okay. Um, but, um, my team read the uh, uh, the Art of Gathering yeah. last year, and whenever we read a book together, we kind of collect all of our favorite passages, and and I have that in a post. I'll send it to you oh, if you awesome. want to distribute it to anybody who doesn't uh, who didn't get a chance to see that. Probably a lot of similar ideas um, from the book and whatever, but it's a nice little highlight. So it's love it. know, twenty or twenty or thirty um, of our favorite quotes from the book. So. I love that. My favorite quote from the book, just not that you asked, was the title of the chapter, Don't Start a Funeral with Logistics. I still I use yeah. that a lot. Um, it kind of gets you in that mindset that there is a, um, a, a feeling we want to evoke here um, and to reflect what the audience needs. Back to the very first question, what's the real need of this community right now? And I love how, that, how she gets us started. Thank you all. It was really great to see you, Reagan. In, Thanks so know, much. And tell Amy we missed her, but we'll we'll record this. Oh, well. so you guys can share it. So, thank That's you. Right. And I'll be in touch with you offline. Thanks. Take care. Bye bye. Bye everybody. Thanks, Thomas. Bye, Keisha. Bye. Have a good weekend, everyone.